There you go. We'll get it. We'll figure it out. Yeah. Cool. Did you get it? I know you don't fuck it up. It ran in my face. Perfect. Oh, I thought you were doing a chop for the audio. I was at first, okay. and then I was trying to kill a bug. We're here at Moto Demic today, and we're going to do a shop tour with Brad. Follow me! <laughs> Alright, so, yeah, we're just going to start. <laughs> gotcha. Hey, this is Brad from Moto Demic. Next. <laughs> This is Devin with Cognito Moto, and today we're here with Brad from Motodemic. And uh, we're going to do a little shop tour and ask him about stuff in his shop. You're Brad. I'm Brad. I'm Brad, founder of Motodemic. When, when did you start this? Uh, March 2015. And why did you start this? Wait, uh, wait, wait, let me rephrase. What made you start Motodemic? What made me start Motodemic, actually, crazy enough, was a phone call with you about fucking, uh, a phone call with you trying to figure out what I was doing for a build I was doing, and asking you about what you were doing for your business, because I was really, I'm really, was really into business development at the time, um, and asking questions with you about, um, you know, about the motorcycle industry, how things Know, how how it really is because I could only you know looking from the outside in it was one way. At the time, I was literally looking for something. I wanted my own business because I was helping other people build businesses. I honestly didn't care if it was vacuum cleaners. Like really, it could have been anything. But I'm passionate about you know motorsport, motorcycle, car, any in, in that realm. And I had a bike that I felt there was a, a product that could be developed for it. Um, and then I immediately saw this vision of uh, this industry not having something like what I'm doing. There's, there's no one addressing uh, fitments for headlight upgrades for for bikes that are you know obscure bike obscure bikes that are I don't know from the 90s to, to now. There's there's a market for everything for old bikes and anything and everything you want for a Harley, but like. There's nothing for street triples. There's nothing for some of these really weird bikes, older monsters. So was that the first bike you made the kit for? Yeah, yeah. The street triple was the first bike I developed the, not developed, I improved upon a, a single headlight conversion and, and made it uh, a single headlight. I didn't invent this. I, I feel like I innovated it to be an, an easy to install product versus something hard. So were these normal headlights to start? Like normal halogen yeah. H4? Yeah, my first my first shots, uh, there's a, a canvas print up here on the wall. Th those were the first prototype. And I at the, at the beginning it was um, halogens because I didn't know where to go with the LED. I knew LED was being developed, but in 2015 there wasn't really any um, motorcycle specific lighting setups. Right, which still doesn't exist. There's that. I don't know of anything right. else other than... Right, there's there's these that we use from JW Speaker that I paired up with in 15. Um, we worked with them to develop a, a non-adaptive light that's branded with our, with, our, with our name on it, but it was, you know, it's meant to be like a really, really good quality motorcycle light um, that gives you looking forward performance, but also allows for vision for you to be seen better while riding from others. That's just as important. Good job, Seth. <laughs> Those JW speakers being so shallow really lets you do a lot of shit. Yeah. Um, when I first started, they were not that shallow. They were a lot deeper, um, especially the non-projector-based lights, the ones that aren't a projector. It still looks kind of like an older light with a reflector in it. Um, those are really deep. They're deeper than 
uh, a, a normal halogen. Um, these, with their heat sinks, have gotten smaller and smaller, and now we're at the point where it's like an inch and a half thick, where it allows easy application onto bikes that maybe have a lot of wiring in the headlight housing, or um, you want to get that light tucked in as tight as you possibly can to the forks. Yeah, well, I like the Triumphs. Mm -hmm. There's a ton of wires in those things. Mm -hmm. So yeah, unless you've got something shallow. Right. Yeah. Now we're we're a quarter of the size of a. The lights now are a quarter of the size of a halogen, easily. So when did the adaptive come out? The adaptive came out in 2016. Um, we were previewed to it because of the relationship we had started with JW Speaker. Um, this light was actually developed for Harley. Uh, because they make the lights, they make all of Harley's Daymakers. And, um, Daymaker, that's the one with the two bulbs? Yeah, the, the up and down. Right. Basically looks the same as a Jeep light that they make. Um, Harley now has some newer lights that look a lot better. But the uh, that old light, this was supposed to be the replacement for that. This was supposed to come after that. And I, I guess uh, Harley didn't bite on the price point. So... Um, they made the decision to reach out to myself and uh, another big industry distributor and say, do you guys think this is something you could sell into the aftermarket at this price point, which at the time was $7.99. It was pretty expensive when they came out. Um, and I, I was like, of course, it's a motorcycle specific light. I think we could run with it, push the safety aspect of it. Right. Um, and that's when I, the, the ball really started going for us as far as making fitments that fit specific <laughs> applications um the conversions is one thing they look really cool but the adapter rings and the um adapting to other bikes that are on the market that maybe already have a round headlight is 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 the where our market's kind of gone does that thing have a gyro in it it's a gyro and accelerometer so the downside of that is just sitting here it's hard to make it do it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Very hard. You got you have one on your bike, right? Right. And I was trying to show people, and I'm just leaning the bike over, and it's not really doing anything. Yeah. Yeah, if you're just sitting there and you lean it over, it'll do a little bit, and then it'll go back. It won't even know it's leaning over. It's it's looking for the G-forces, and that's actually like a huge uh, safety element because if you're in a lean at a high rate of speed, you're pulling enough G-forces if a normal gyroscope would think it's flat. Your, your G's are right. being pulled into the corner. Um, so you would have a light that would be turning off in the middle of the corner. So the accelerometer, it knows I have G-forces being pulled on me this way. And I know this is my lean angle from, from zero the last time I saw it. And it'll, it'll compensate for that. And it'll even hold full lean optics, even if you're not full lean, but going fast enough. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's... It's a really trick. A lot of over-engineering on it. Yeah, I didn't think about that. But yeah, it's like being in an airplane. Mm -hmm. You're going around. You feel like you're sitting flat, but you're yep. pitched way over. Yep. That makes sense. Nice. It like went in your nose and then right back out. The plug. So what all does Motodemic do? Um, day to day. I would say uh, keeping up with demand. Uh, well, more like what do you produce? What do you, what do you make? I, we make uh, conversion kits and adapters for uh, LED upgrades. For so that's, that's headlight mounting, yep. adapters. Yep. I don't know. What else do you make? That's pretty much it. Headlight brackets, housings to hold the lights. I don't make those, but we've got a really good selection that I've kind of handpicked what I think is easy to get, easy to have uh, refinished. So all of our all of our housings and everything, it's not an off-the-shelf finish. It's all done here uh, in the States with um, like high-end prismatic powders, powder coating. I don't know what that is. Um, prismatic, uh, you know, their stuff is really, really good quality. This mat... You can touch it with and get, you know, you can touch it and not get fingerprints on it. Oh, that's but nice. it's a matte that doesn't, it still stays very matte. It doesn't get the gloss to it. You can also wash it with like dish soap, which would normally turn matte kind of glossy. 
this stuff will stay exactly like this once you rinse it off. I didn't know that either. I'd never washed powder coat with dish soap. <laughs> well, like, uh, you know, the, I've found that a lot of mats out there, they'll turn kind of glossy after hand oils have been on them and can, they can kind of be a bitch to clean. These seem to, this powder coat seems to hold up really, really well to that. Rub your forehead on it. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? I thought you made other shit. Did you make like license plate deletes or some shit? No. It's all gauge front of the bike. Yeah, gauge relocation. Um, so definitely like bikes like the XSR 900, soon to be the XSR 700. I've focused more on having product lines for these bikes, having more than just an LED upgrade. I want someone to be able to come and get you know, different headlight brackets to fix the ones that come on the bike that are kind of, you know, it's a, it's a budget. Those are budget bikes. Right. So uh, I feel like I'm providing parts to make these bikes a premium bike where you're turning a $9,000 bike into something that could maybe look like a thirteen, fourteen thousand $14,000 bike like that XSR back there. Um, your wheels make that look, I think, way worth way more than just the the, the two thousand dollars it costs to put the yeah, wheels it on. It makes it look so much more aggressive. Um, you know, cleaning off all of the faux machined cast parts that they stick on these bikes to make them look classic. Um, those have been eliminated with the number plate uh, headlight brackets that are much more streamlined and machined. Did you make the brake reservoir? No. Oh, that little mount? Yeah. I slapped that together. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Why don't you sell that? Because there's 10 other people that already make something like that for oh. for more. Yeah, that thing's cool. Yeah, I literally slapped, slapped that together. There's actually a light I see people using a lot right now building bikes where it's like the spider eye where there's like five rows of little optics. It's a fog light. It's not a headlight. Oh, it is an actual fog light that has side bolt mounting on it to be used as a fog light. But it says DOT SAE on it somehow. And people are using it as a headlight on their bikes. So do you care about the DOT SAE? I do. Yeah. Big time. The volume I'm selling the lights, like the, the amount of lights we sell outside of the country, in the country, um, I feel like a, I feel a certain obligation to making sure what we're selling is legit. What about Europe? Um, Europe is extremely strict. They're strict on having ECE, but they have more lenience on using LED. They're, they're, they see the, the benefit in it. But you change your, your projection or your angle. What is it called? Is it the, projection? The, yeah, the, project, the, the optic or the layout pattern. Um, so our new lights, the, the Evo S and, and the Adaptive, use a world optic. So it's a symmetrical beam pattern. It's legal in left-hand drive, right-hand drive. Doesn't matter where you are in the world. Same light works for everyone, everywhere. And it's just flat. Why wasn't that a thing before? Uh, original older ECE lights like uh, Ducati Monster, the big Bosch light they use, the old halogen, was a symmetrical pattern for world use. Well, that makes your life a lot easier, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. On these new ones, the older lights that I had that were not motorcycle lights, like the the Evo Two, the old the old looking one that looks like a daymaker. Right. Um, those are EC left, EC right, DOT. There's six different lights to stock because two colors. Yeah, no, that does suck. Yeah, that's why I don't even sell all those. Yeah, these these new lights that I have every everywhere, the same light doesn't matter where I'm shipping it. How many different lights are there? Um, adaptive and non-adaptive. Same same setup? Seven inch for both. And I have a five and three quarter adaptive and non-adaptive for five and three, for five and three quarter. Shit, I didn't know you had a five and three quarter. Mm -hmm. I have a bucket I use for it. It's like a little, it looks like a little mini uh, Truxton bucket. Will it fit in a Bates? Yes, it'll drop right into a Bates. Shit. Do you combo that? You need to combo that. I haven't. Because the Bates is a good seller. Can you get the Bates without the stupid uh, high beam indicator? You have to weld that and paint it, right? Just leave it in there. Why don't you just leave it in there? Just leave it there. Yeah. 
Because they only come like the only ones I can find now are the uh, the one with the glass on it, mm -hmm. with the with the filament, the the projector mm -hmm. reflector lenses. I wish that you could get a better. Um, what is that? Like a Dyna, a Harley. Or just a glass bait style bucket. Right. The Harley one's nice because it's actually really low profile, so you can fit. It. It, you can't. It's it's smaller than a Bates. It's not as deep. Well, it's nice to. Well, don't want to cannibalize your business here, but it's a bottom mount. Right. So it's easier to mount. Yeah. I have a, a pedestal mount light that doesn't use a housing. That's just a pedestal. The fins on the back of the light are shaped more like a bucket, but not a full bucket. Yeah, we need to look at all this stuff because I don't even know that you have that. Yeah, that one's easy. That one's cool. I only have that in adaptive because it's just... Because isn't... isn't uh... Arch using this, the, the... Yeah, they're using the, these. The adaptives. Yep. Seven inch. What about uh, Confederate? Five and three quarters. Same thing. Yep. Yeah, it's funny. It's funny how these big brands like that are using Moto Gadget. Moto Gadget gauges. Mm-hmm. Moto Gadget control. I think that thing's about to turn off. I heard it do something. All right, you want to wander around the shop? XSR 900, seen this on Instagram. It's got some really great wheels. Yeah, I wonder who made those. I don't know, but I think it really makes this bike. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So the the whole goal with this XSR 900 for us was to come up with a full product line, front to back. Um, your wheels uh, were definitely a big part of that. I was really glad that we could help in any way we could with that um, because I think it makes this bike that's a, a cheap bike a more expensive bike. Um, yeah, we, we cover this thing front to back with different headlight brackets, um, gauge relocation with a really nice gauge back. Uh, where is it centered? Dead center? Or where is it stock? Dead center. Stock, it sits up here on a flat piece of sheet metal. Uh, it just kind of looks out of place. It, it looks like they spent five bucks to mount the, the gauge, you know? Um, this was the idea behind this was to streamline it. Um, I actually kind of borrowed this concept of this gauge back from the Ducati Scrambler, because they yeah, that's right. Yeah, they cheaply stick it on there, but they actually do a good job of making it look streamlined with this nice gauge back. Um, and I actually spent a lot of time getting this gauge out of the way. It was kind of distracting where it was at, um, but still fully visible down here. All right. Out of the way the key too. Yeah, that was big. You don't want your keys hit from the screen. But subtle stuff, you know, I like to think this is what the accountants, the accountants saw this bike and were like, no, no, you guys need to make some stuff a little cheaper on these things. And the designers had to go back to the drawing board and, and do what they did when it came from the factory. So 60th edition, you want to talk about the signature on it? Yeah, so it's actually signed by Kenny Roberts. Um, he's local to here out of Modesto. Uh, so we kind of get involved with some of the events he does for fundraising. Uh, it's really important, a really important aspect of what we try to do. And uh, it's just a bright opportunity to have him sign it at one of his charity dinners. So originally the wheels were for, uh, what was it, an MT-09? Yeah, it was a um, MT-FZ-09 that they were turning into like an off-road bike that they needed spoked wheels for. Right, so they sent us the wheels and we did the original spoke version. Yep, yep, for that build. And I was uh, I was very keen on getting that on this one as well at that time. All right, so you designed a part and you want to make something that you can test fit. That's where, yeah. did I just answer my own question? You did, you sure did. Well, explain explain <laughs> the, uh, the MakerBot. So the MakerBot comes into play, uh, allows for rapid prototyping. Uh, we can design something, print it in a few hours, and just see if it's gonna work for mock-up, see if it's gonna fit uh, the application, uh, and really get a good idea of how it's gonna look on the bike. Um, you know, sometimes we'll design something where it's a little bit more basic, and when it comes onto the bike, it actually looks basic. It doesn't look as nice. Um, so we add, you know, a little design element to it that is functional to clear the wiring harness, but also give it a little bit more shape. 
So when you print that, do you have to print uh, support material? Uh, this one, yes, uh, to support the inside when it was being printed. This type of printer, it's a lower end, but you know, as long as you kind of know what you're getting into when you're printing it or you design around some of those limitations, um, you can print just about anything without this, the need of like a, a washable support material. How long does something like that take to make in there? Um, this was probably a five or six hour print. Ooh. Yeah. This is a pretty high detail. Damn. <laughs> 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 Seriously, five, five hours. Five or That's six a hours. Long yeah. Time. But the great thing is, uh, I can hit print, and I'm not. Wa I don't have to watch it like a machine. where worried about collisions happening or tools breaking or anything like that. How much? How much? Uh, I don't know. What would you get in there? Warpage or deflection? Uh, there is a little bit, um, and as long as you are okay with a little bit of tolerance or variance in the size, you can get away with with it. Um, a lot of these things I'll print and I'll actually tap the holes. I'll put it on the bike and I'll go ride the bike with it on there to see if there's anything weird. The really cool thing is if it's gonna vibrate really bad with this print, it's you usually know it's still gonna vibrate with an aluminum seal. You almost can do some stress testing with, with these. I saw where they were putting wire in that stuff. Do it, put a layer for it, you could run wire. Yep. There's a... I think it's Maker Forged. They do one where it's printing a, just like this, this style of print, but it'll actually put a, a strand of carbon fiber on the inside of some of the oh, layers. Oh, it'll do it itself. Yeah, so you could print a functional brake lever from it, like a real usable brake lever, because it has carbon strands inside. That's legit. Yeah. This is my set toolbox. This toolbox doesn't have tools in it. It doesn't? My it's real like toolbox tools? is over there. These are like basic vegetables. Wait, so hey, wait, can I touch this stuff? Yeah. I'm just going up in your shit here. So this is a five and three quarter. That's five and three quarter non-adaptive. That'll work. Do they the make base. this in adaptive? Yeah. It's got your logo in it. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Does it light up? Yeah. That whole bottom lights up almost as bright as the, the low beam. Yeah, no, that's cool. So when you thought started this, you think you were gonna have seven hundred dollar lights just chilling in your toolbox? No. <laughs> Why not? Luckily, that's a cheaper light because it's not the fancy adaptive one. I've been trying to, you know, have something for everyone, which leads you to having, you know, only a couple options. Because if you have a, a cheap, right. cheap option, you don't, you won't sell the the nicer option. Oh, what would you call this area? Uh, this area is like the general area where people sit, but it also doubles as our studio for filming all of the install videos. Um, I do some photography in here, but this is really where uh, the install videos happen. So that explains all the lighting. Yeah, yeah. Those help, help, help see the parts that I'm installing. All right, let's uh, check out the shop. Yeah, let's figure it out. What the hell is that? Bug assault. Oh, to shoot the bugs. Shoot the flies, shoot yeah. Does it work? Yeah, it just, just shoots salt. Does it hurt? <laughs> oh shit. Ah! <laughs> 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 it's got a little stick to a it. A little bit. It's got yeah. quite a spread too. <laughs> Let's to hit the fly. USPS drop off by four. We have wait, to drop wait. off by four. You can't get them to pick up either? No, that's not going to happen. They'll pick up at one o'clock, three o'clock, or ten o'clock. Our guy is like, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I don't have my truck. I'm coming no, back. Yeah, no. Why don't you just tell me you're not coming back? This is our uh, shipping area. This is Seth right here. He does our shipping. What's up, guys? Here, and he does wheel building at Cognito. It's pretty. Yeah, commuting's a bitch. All right, so over here. You got a CNC. It's a little different than what we have. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's called a Daytron Neo. It's a little guy. Um, there are concept behind these machines is small, high-speed 
uh, CNC milling. This is a three axis machine. Um, everything's in here. Tooling, um, vice, vacuum table, everything in here we need to be able to make the parts we, we make. Uh, some of our stuff's made here, some of our stuff's made uh, throughout the area by local machine shops or sheet metal shops. Uh, but some of our new really trick stuff was coming out of this machine. So spindle speed on this is? 40,000 RPM. 40,000. Yeah. So our spindle speed is 12,000. And mm -hmm. that's on an SS, so a, a bumped up version. Yeah. This is spinning like three and a half times faster. Yeah. That's impressive. Yeah, very high speed. Um, but I'm taking very small cuts. There's not a lot of, hor a lot of horsepower there, but the but it lacks in horsepower, it makes up in speed. Because there's it's liquid cooled. There's a cooler in the back uh, pumping liquid through the spindle head, and air is also going through the spindle head to keep it cool. Oh, to keep the spindle itself cool. Yeah, yeah. And you know, a lot of a lot of CNC machines when you do its warm-up cycle, it just right. moves the tables around. This doesn't move any tables, it just runs the spindle from twenty thousand RPMs to forty thousand RPMs. Um, if I leave it a few days, it's an hour spindle warm up, and if I just come in day after day, it's only ten minutes. Minute oh, so you need to warm it up every day, mm -hmm. which isn't a bad idea. Either. No, no. Like if we've been stopping for a few hours, I'd warm it up again. It only takes ten minutes. And then, how much of the the table is vacuum? Uh, right now, I only have half of the vacuum table in, so that back part is one vacuum table. I can take the vise out and put another vacuum table. So I have a full 500 by 400 millimeter vacuum table, the whole, the whole thing. Whereas we're, we're dependent on vices. Correct. But I'm not making things like what you make that would require a lot of force to hold it. Um, a lot of the stuff I make is flat. You know, these, these adapter rings are made from discs which are vacuumed down very easily and then um, I'll bolt it to a, a a plate that is nice and flat to vacuum down that is exactly oh, so you, on the second off you're vacuuming again yep that's kind of cool and, uh, and on this it has a built-in uh, probe and I have my program set up so that I just set these in there it probes the parts every run is part. that part of the? Do you put I that in Jika? That. Uh, no, I do it on here on the controller, and I'm now coding it by hand in the computer. So you this doesn't use G code. It uses simple. Simple. Yeah, simple coding, like the files dot simple. But you're still using Fusion mm -hmm. for tool paths. Yeah, yeah. I'll edit that part in between Fusion and the machine. I'll go edit the post. Do a uh, do a tool change because that's pretty cool. So when I grab that tool, it's blasting air on everything, right? To keep yep. it clean. Yep. There's air coming through the spindle and air coming out of those two nozzles. Wait, where's the probe for the part? Is it one of those tools? It's up here. Here, I'll, I'll probe a part real quick. Right Holy fuck. And that has holes. My Z. So how does it know how far down it goes? Is it set that so touch off the end. Yeah. It goes Z, and down. then it knows. So right here, if I hold these, um, so this part actually has a pretty good sized chamfer on it. Instead of going down half a minute, millimeter, I'm going to tell it to put all of those at uh, one. 
negative one millimeter. So it's going to set all those to go down at one millimeter. I could change that. I'm going to have one be at half millimeter down, and the other ones are like five millimeters, however, from that. Each one of those squares is a vacuum area that I can turn on and off. And that, that's a piece of paper, isn't it? Yeah, so I can machine into it. That's why you see those machine marks. So I can machine through, it's like a cardstock. I can machine through, so I'm machining full depth past the part. That way your edge your edge on the bottom is really nice. You're not tearing up your vacuum tape. Correct. And this has a safety setup. It will not go below the uh, 0 0.02 of a millimeter. 0 0.2 of a millimeter into the paper, above the vacuum table, there's a safety. Like it cannot hit the t table. It can hit the vise right now because I don't have the safety turned on, but just hit the green. I just slowed that down. It just and it just set zero. To that corner. So that, that's how it's protecting square. Correct. One, two, points. Well, I just set points, so now I'm at 15 millimeters above that corner. If I measured a circle, it would measure, it would do center of circle. I can do the inside of the circle, outside of the circle. I can do a square, it would go to the middle of the square. So are you running multiple work offsets? Yeah. So every single one of those measurements, it'll move the work offset to wherever I just measured to. So if you're running a ring, you're running, let's say, 54, I don't know what yours would be, it'll, one, two, or three. It'll do whatever I want it to do, yeah. And I adjust the program to that, where I just, I could set that square in there completely crooked and sideways. It'll and it adjust the it. entire program to that square. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That's yeah. pretty cool for, like, nesting. Yes. That's why I'm able to fit... Uh, but does it understand, like, hey, don't go over here now? I can. I can do that. So when I have the other vacuum table in there, I put these templates I made, these uh, block-off sheets. So I can drop the raw stock in here, and this blocks the vacuum, so I get, like, 100% vacuum on round objects. So when you're, you don't cut all the way through, you get down to... What? I go all the way through. I go through into that paper. Oh, into the paper. Yep. Is the paper something they supply? Or you just end up with a ton of it? Um, they sell these cards. Are they expensive? No. I think it was like 50 bucks for like a thousand of them. Oh, oh shit. And yeah, I could go to any print shop with this paper and say, make me these. And I could have it say Motodemic on there if I wanted to. It's just cardstock. But it's nice having the squares. Right. Is that yours too? Yeah. It's a lot of bikes. That one's one of my faves. That's why I put those uh, those gold OZs on it. Wait, did you have that before? I've had it for a long time. 350. Speed triple. Street triple 765. Street triple. This is the next one in line, the, the newer monster generations. Speed 1050. So wait, so what are you doing for the Ducati? So the Ducati would be a headlight conversion similar to what we do with the older bikes. Put a more uh, classic style round headlight on it to make it look similar to the older monsters. Get rid of this flat, um, modern headlight. You doing anything else with it? This one? Just depends. See what's under there? Yep. Wait, so when you make the kit, you make everything plug in? Plug and play, everything. And that's not necessarily just an H4 plug. No, no. This will have like a really funky um, waterproof plug. Um, that's right. The monster down there has a really funky plug. The newer ones have like a Bosch plug that's used on like Volvos. It's like random, random connections. Because they're molded into the plastic of the housing. Right. Right. Because it runs the little parking lot and all that. Correct. Is this the same as the uh, street, street Twin? Yep, same exact upgrade, same exact uh, adapter ring. This is just our, our Evo S light, the, the branded one made by, made by JW, JW Speaker. So does your kit work for this too? 
that you use on the street toy? Or do you have them? You... I don't have. Our Triumph Classics headlight brackets will work on these forks. Um, the Street Twin's actually a pain because the gauge brackets molded into the headlight brackets. Oh, that's right. Uh, street Cup, Street Scrambler, Bonneville T120, uh, it's not. Or T100, all the, the non Street Twin models. But you can get the gauge bracket from like um, the Bobbers, uh, the, T, the T model, uh, the Street Cup, but the Street Cup has dual, dual, dual gauges. Does somebody make attack for these things yet? No oh, that I've seen. And I've heard these these gauges are really sensitive to vibration. So I've seen some of the gauge mounts that are out there actually cause these to uh, fail. Mm. R9T, we have a drop in LED upgrade for it, but I don't have a the light in it right now. What year is it? That's a 18. Yeah, this is an older 796. And this is, this is honestly the, the bike that, you know, the single headlight conversion we did for the Street Triples was, was a cool product. Um, but this conversion is really what turned this business into a business. Like, this is where the volume and all of the, the real hard engineering behind what lights we were using, what options we were offering, everything behind that stemmed from this bike uh, with the Street Triple kind of sparking it. But I, I would say the company really took off when we did the monster conversion. And I offer all the signals we sell are all offered pre-wired. To get, again, kind of go with that thought process, anything's pre-wired. We'll pre-wire the Moto Gadgets here to have the same bullets like a Rizoma will. Metric bullets too, which makes it harder. <laughs> What can you see? Just my nose? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you can't see up my nose. Alright, so here we're going to show Brad how to make a part. <laughs> <laughs>